Good evening and welcome to Talk of the Town, the March edition. As uh, the past the couple months, our uh, normal uh, host, not normal host, our usual host, <laughs> uh, Terry Devaney, is in our South Florida bureau. I'm Len Lucci here attempting to uh, replace him. On my left is Lynn Skirpon, attorney extraordinaire. On my right is our extraordinary mayor, G. Frederick Robinson. And we're going to talk tonight about federal, uh, state, and local issues of interest and politics that go with it. So let's start off with uh, today the Republicans released their, their budget, Ryan 2.0. And uh, what do you think about the budget? Well, it's got some interesting dimensions to it. I mean, if, if you look at the assessment, um, it reduces, it eliminates a whole array of deductions, reduces the taxing brackets to two. I think they're 10 and 20? 25. 10 and 25. Reduces corporate taxes to 25. The big thing is it makes some dramatic changes to Medicare. Uh, it says if you're 55 or over, nothing changes. But if you're under 55, there's proposals in there that when you get to be Medicare eligible, you can either join the existing Medicare or go something else. And I think that's going to be a, a serious discussion issue, you know, between both parties on that. But uh, I'm not sure it's uh, I'm not sure it's intended to pass both both houses because I mean it's going to be dead on arrival when it gets to the Senate side, and I mean that that's a given. But uh, it's going to provoke a very specific and dramatic difference between proposals. I mean, the argument behind this is it, it reduces uh, the debt by something like $9 trillion over 10 years or something, but, and, and returns the money that was, would have been covered in the, um, taken out of the defense budget as a result of the agreements last year. So it's interesting, it's challenging, and it's certainly going to cause people to talk. Len? I agree, it's dead on arrival. I think it may be a good first talking point, starting point, um, but I think it's too big, um, too dramatic, and the the legwork has not been laid to to get any any anything done. And there may be little parts of it that that may survive, but basically, I don't think any of it will survive this year. Well, I believe that Ryan 2.0 is a Christmas in March for the Democrats, mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. for the rich you get a tax cut of $150,000 for the poor. They are slashing food stamps, housing assistance, Medicaid, and they're ending Medicare as we know it. So I think it gives the Democrats a great platform to run on this fall, and they should be thanking every Republican they can see today in Washington. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I don't think anybody believes this, this, this plan will pass. Uh, it certainly won't pass this year. Um, and I don't see how it does unless both houses yeah. turn over and, and there's a change in the White House. I, I just, just don't see how it happens. So speaking of the White House, um, how is uh, Willard Mitt Romney doing? I mean, everyone knows that he's the front runner and he has this uh, big lead in delegates, but he has to have a majority and not just the plurality. So can he do that? I, I don't know. Uh, they, they're in Illinois as we're taping today, and um, it's 54. If I recall, he's, he's mid-500s in terms of delegates committed to him. So he's about twice what Santorum has. And the, the people that know far more about Illinois than do I suggest that he's going to do very, very well there. Part of the problem is Santorum is not even a candidate in about 10 of the congressional mm -hmm. districts. He has the same problem he had in Ohio and, and in Virginia by not getting on the ballot. Uh, my guess is he's going to come out of... Um, Illinois probably close to 600. Uh, he needs 11 something to to earn a thing, and so um, it puts him in, in good. There's gonna be a big contest in in Pennsylvania at the end of the month, which is Santorum country, and then of course then they gotta gotta go to the big states in New York and California and Texas and all those. So I think it's numerically, I think he's got the, the oomph to get to the 1100. At least that you can see a path for that. I don't see a path. For Santorum, and I think Gingrich and um, Paul are just going to be left at the gate. Does Gingrich staying in uh, help or hurt Romney getting to 1144? I think it hurts because I think I still think he's going to get a few delegates here and there. I think he'll cut into it. Um, and as far as I hear, and I guess you hear, Gingrich is staying in all the way to the convention. So I think he just chisels away at everybody else. Yeah, the, the Democrats have got to be really enjoying this, too. 
um, just watching them all in, the, in their uh, in their demolition derby, mm -hmm. tearing each other apart. Um, I mean, people said that that Obama and Hillary had that kind of a race four years ago, but and it got a little tense, but it was never like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, calling each other liars and crooks, <laughs> and I mean, it's just terrific. So. <laughs> Yeah, what was it somebody said, uh, if you promise not to, to lie about me, I promise not to tell truth about you. <laughs> but you know, the, the fun part that I, that I find amusing, I, I remember when all the Republicans were lined up and said, oh, good, we want to run against this guy, Obama. And I remember back in the 80s and Democrats said, oh, we want to run against this guy, Reagan. And in both of those cases, it was a surprise. Uh, my guess is the Democrats are anticipating they're going to run against um, Romney. Mm -hmm. um, and... Actually, this one in Illinois is the first one, I think, where it's just the two of them. So um, if Santorum does better than expected there, I think he stays alive for a little bit longer. If he gets crushed there, which I don't think will happen, but if he did, that could change the whole dynamic. Gingrich is still, I think he's in it because he's got such a high level of personal animosity now towards Mr. Romney that goes back to Iowa. Uh, he's been angry at Romney since the since that campaign, and yeah, you can't help but assume that his presence in the race is more personal than it is substantive. I, I I don't see how he can can draw a line from where he is to Tampa. Yeah, he goes to all these primary states, and each state he visits their zoo, <laughs> and it's <laughs> kind of strange. Now you're being redundant again, or what? <laughs> And his wife follows him around. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, every pre-primary poll has underestimated Santorum. I mean, mm -hmm. in the South, mm -hmm. with uh, Mississippi and Alabama, he, all the polls had him coming in third, mm -hmm. and he came in first because they underestimate the evangelical Christian vote that he's been uh, picking mm -hmm. up. And so, you don't know. I mean, Illinois is really two states. It's Chicago, and then the southern part of the state is like, is like the South. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and it is, it is but no, the, problem, the problem he has is some of the congressional districts that, that he's not registered are in that in that area where you would e normally expect him to do well. Right. Uh, so he's he seated ten delegates from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's only competing for out of the, a portion of the remaining forty some. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right. He's he's done very well. He's done. Stuff. But like I say, that's why I think Illinois is, is interesting just from an, um, a historical perspective because it's the first time really the two of them have been one, basically one-on-one -on -one, because Paul is a non-issue in, in Illinois and Gingrich is down in Louisiana or someplace else. You know, I found out, I heard that the um, local Illinois um, Santorum had uh, withdrew a challenge to the Romney delegates because their delegate petitions were notarized in Massachusetts, and they're supposed to be notarized in Illinois. But he said, oh, for the good of the party, I'm withdrawing the, the uh, challenge. And the, oh, I didn't even and know the, And the Santorum people in, in, in uh, Virginia want to come out and, and strangle this guy. But <laughs> I think that, I mean, uh, so, well, you know, they're all, it's a they're, weird game. Yeah. It's hard the, to explain those, those mechanical things that seem to get in the way of something. The other thing that Democrats ought to be really glad about is that these Republicans are spending a ton of money beating each other up. I think they said um, Romney has outspent Santorum in Illinois yeah, by about 10, 10 to eight, 1. Eight or, 10, 8 or 10 to 1. And he doesn't have that much money left. I mean, the money will come in, but he's, yeah. Obama's collected and $45 he, million dollars last month. And he's going to yeah. have a hard, yeah. if he is the, the winner, he's going to have an awful hard uh, I, general. The, the one thing, I'm, if I were looking at the Republican race closely, uh, my guess is Romney's going to be quite capable of raising a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's going to be enough, I don't know. There, there was a thing on uh, CNN the other day where a lot of the money that uh, Obama drew in the last race from, from Wall Street is not showing up this time. Um, and a couple of the big donors are, are sitting out. Um, I think at the end of the day, he's going to end up with more than an adequate war chest, both for his own money plus the uh, the PAC money that he's now accepted. Yeah, he could finance his own campaign. Yeah. Uh, maybe, so. maybe sell one of his five houses. Who's it, Romney? Romney. Oh, oh, I thought you were talking about the president. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think he'll be fine in raising. I mean, you got to understand, too, he's got a, a personal fortune that uh, he can spend some from, too. But uh, I don't think he'll... Lynn's right. He's, they're, they're burning money in the primary that 
in, retro, in, in you know six seven months from now they're going to wish they they had. Back. But if you don't get to that point, of then course. it does it doesn't do you well to leave end up with a pot full of money and no nomination. Right. But still, they're they're taking money away from sure. the Republican candidate, mm -hmm. whoever that is. Mm -hmm. Hey, Romney spent like $65,000 per delegate that he's gotten, and Santorum spent like $25,000 per delegate that he's uh, Yeah, received. I don't know what those numbers are. Yeah. I just saw something in Illinois where Romney spent like $2.5 million, and uh, Santorum spent a couple hundred thousand. I don't think Santorum is really contesting Illinois, even though he's, he will probably do better mm -hmm. than people expect him to do. And he'll probably, he's way ahead in the polls on, for Saturday in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. and, and not too many people know, I bet, in our viewing audience land that there's a Maryland primary on April 3rd. Mm -hmm. And uh, tomorrow, uh, Willard Mitt Romney is coming to Arbutus. I'll be the guest of former Governor Ehrlich. He's going to have a town hall at the uh, American Legion I didn't um, know that. hall there. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to get too many other presidential candidates. I think Maryland's probably a safe state for oh, Romney. Sure. Um, safe state for Romney? I mean, in, 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 the, in, the, in the, the primary. Oh, in the, the primary. primary. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, against Santorum. And, yeah. And I don't the other think guys. Will, Maryland will not go in the Romney camp in the general. Right. And then there's not much else on the ballot. I mean, that President Obama's unopposed. Uh, Senator Cardin has a bunch of po uh, potential Republican challengers, and, mm -hmm. and and one major Democratic challenger, Senator um, Anthony Muse. And then um, we get the vote for uh, for school board. Mm -hmm. uh, and the top two winners in each district will go on to the November election. So it's not going to be a huge turnout, I don't think, for the April 3rd primary. And they'll have early voting starting on Saturday, March 24th at the Bowie Library. And mm -hmm. it might be lonely there, too, compared to last time. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the race that might draw some interest would be the Senate race, because Cardin's done very well mm -hmm. here. And, and I think even the, the, the post and the endorsed uh, Cardin very, very effusively this week. Um, and I think the, um, the Republican, there's two or three Republicans, the, the one, um, I know I'm going to mispronounce his name, but the, the guy that was the Secret Service, Bongino. Bongino. Yeah. Oh, that's right. It's got that mm -hmm. Italian punctuation. Uh, and that's who I would suspect will be the contestants in the general. Uh, I've heard it, I heard him speak a while back, and um, uh, he's very informed and very comes across very well. You know, whether he's got the the ability to put funds and canopy and stuff together on a statewide basis, I think remains to be seen. But um, who knows? I saw perhaps the best uh, TV ad for a campaign I've seen in a while. It's called "My Friend Ben," about how Ben Cardinal worked to have uh, dental insurance after Diamante Driver mm -hmm. died of a, a dental infection in Prince George's County a few mm -hmm. years ago. Just real, it's a, just a real warm and, and fuzzy ad, mm -hmm. um, which people say he needs because he's not a gregarious guy. So. He is. I mean, you know, in all the time I've known Mr. Cardin, you know, you, you always kind of get the sense he's kind of a little stiff. He's an he's incredibly bright guy. Yes, he is. Oh, yeah. um, but you're right. You, you don't see him back slapping and telling jokes and whatever. He just, um, you know, I don't know whether it's... Uh, a, an inherent shyness or something that still lingers after 30, 40 years in, in public office. But uh, the guy clearly understands. When he was in Maryland, he knew the budget stuff in and out and every which way. And he's done well at, at the um, at the federal level. So I, I can't imagine him not winning the primary, and I can't imagine him not winning the general. So, um, and like I say, from from my perspective, from the city's perspective, you know, he's been a good friend for us. So, uh, even though he has a primary thing and my role is nonpartisan. He has an event in uh, Prince George's County Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. this coming Sunday afternoon, uh, Women for Carton. Mm -hmm. And uh, the goal is to get as many women and, and men. Uh, oh, yeah, and men. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, afterthought. Uh, uh, to come out and uh, show him his support in Prince George's. And he's been, I've, I've seen him on the campaign trail a few mm -hmm. times lately. And uh, well, you he, know the you're right, he's not the most. Yeah. Um, he's not gregarious. No, yeah. but he is serious. He is smart. He is a consensus builder. Mm -hmm. He works hard. He knows his issues. He knows well, let me, let me Let me tell the viewers one thing here. And, you know, this, this is really in a non 
political thing, but it's, it, te it tells me about the man. You know, when, I'm in the, when I was in the middle of my fight with the governor and the legislative leadership about this crazy, outrageous, stupid redistricting plan <laughs> that they put together. You didn't like Cardin, it? Cardin called me about something, and we talked a little bit about it, and he says, uh, let me make some calls. It's probably too late in the process to do much, but I'll, I'll do it. And of all the people that, that told me, oh, yeah, I'll get back, he's the only one that followed up with a phone call. I said, look, I talked to the people. I said, the reality is that, you know, you know, we're just not going to be able to stop this. I know you're not going to be happy with it. You know, I'll do everything I can. To work. But he's the one that, that he was the only one of all my federal elected officials and all my state mm -hmm. elected officials that took the time to pick up the phone and call me back and said, Fred, I, you know, I conveyed your message and I agree with you. I think this is a bad decision. Um, but at this point, there's, there's just nothing I can do to change that course. And, you know, I appreciate it. I mean, that kind of one-on-one, -on -one, I think mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't overvalue. So the election for that is April 3rd. Um, by April 2nd, the Maryland General Assembly has to have a, a budget done. The Senate has its version. The House is working on its version. They may go to conference committee as early as this uh, weekend. Uh, however, it turns out we know two things are going to happen. One is um, people's income taxes will go up. How many, we don't know. But there will be people with, with increase in income tax. And two, we know that the state's going to give to the uh, to the counties, the responsibility, at least the funding part of teachers' um, pensions, mm -hmm. and so because um, both houses have different forms of those, and the third is they they're saying that if uh, schools don't adequately uh, fund, uh, if the counties don't adequately fund the school system, the state could seize some of the county's income tax revenue, the controller would actually, <laughs> and send that money to the school system, which mm -hmm. is. Uh, a very drastic measure, but um, yeah. there's good reasons for it, I guess. Uh, so, how do you, what do you think is coming on with the budget? Is this a, a middle of the road budget, a democratic budget, a conservative budget? Well, it's not a conservative budget. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, the the reliance on balancing the budget is coming from the tax side. Um, that's a given. Um, I think the, the, the troublesome of it is going to be there's a lot of blowback from the, the counties particularly about the idea about transferring the pension liabilities back to the county. We've talked about this before, and this is where I have this incredible mixed feelings about this because, you know, on the one hand, I think the state can make an arguable case that if the counties are going to set the salary rates, they should inherit the, the cost associated with the, with the pensions. Unfortunately, the counties are saying we can't afford to do that. I mean, this is the way it's been forever and ever, and we do our part and you do your part. So this is going to be a major break in a tradition and a history. Uh, so not only, I think, is, it, is the dollar effect going to be significant in the counties, I think the long-term relationship between the counties and the state may take a big hit over this. Um, how significant that'll be, I don't know. Um, so it, it's just hard to see how it's going. But I, I suspect you're right. I think at the end of the day, the legislature is going to focus on some kind of an income tax increase to cover some shortfall. Uh, I think the idea about setting these, uh, in, these incredible, well, incredible, I think is the right word, standards for funding education in the various counties that go, in some cases, way beyond what even the, the local school superintendents and school administrations have asked for. Uh, and this is a case where it looks like from the outside that the state has decided how much money the local people should spend on education as opposed to the local people don't. That's going to cause some blowback too, uh, particularly over in areas like Wicomico and uh, uh, Wooster and all that. They're in their per, per, per rata share of expenses that goes to education may triple or quadruple. Uh, and that's going to be a big, a big hill f you know, for some of those folks to get over. What do you think, Lynn? Well, we've had, you know, Maryland prides itself on having the best public schools in the country the last several years running. And to do that, at least many believe you have to put the money in to do it. I don't think it's all about money, but mm -hmm. I think, generally speaking, most believe that. We, we can't let our schools go back now. And... To do that, we've got to come up with money somewhere. I think, you know, the income tax is a done deal in some form or another. Um, is the gas tax now off the table? Last time, I'm, I'm hearing it's pretty much dead. 
Seems like it. I think it's pretty good. Every person I have spoken to, just every lay person mm -hmm. I've run into, complains about Governor O'Malley and that gas tax. That's the first comment everybody comes up with. Mm -hmm. It is so unpopular. I don't see how he can get it through with legislators that have to go home, ultimately deal with their constituents and get reelected at some point. I think that's a critical thing. I think the legislators yeah. are anticipating Don't have the stomach being run out of town with a pitchfork mm -hmm. if they support that ta gasoline right. tax. The shame is it's been 20 years mm -hmm. since the gas tax was raised. It's not a percentage of the, ga of the price. It's a fixed rate. Mm -hmm. And all of our transportation money has gone into the inter-county connector. Right. There's no money left for local projects. We have bridges that are going to crumble and, and fall down and, and no revenue for it. So mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the gas tax proposal didn't come down to the delegates of senators until about one month into the session and and they weren't really clued in what was going to happen and um, perhaps might have had a better chance but I mean public opinion polls show that it has like a 15 percent support and so oh, well, I it's think tough to go yeah, out but, there and, and be yeah. courageous on that but part of the problem is is the legislators shot themselves in the foot on this at least with the legislative leadership by taking the money out of the trust fund and using it for what may have been credible, uh, reasonable purposes, they, they just del you know, destroyed the fund. And then they came back and said, oh my goodness, we don't have any money in the fund, we have to raise taxes to replenish it. Your argument is sound in that you know, there's road projects, there's bridge projects that have gone beyond inconvenient to probably dangerous levels. But the fact that, that you know, when you have the President of the Senate get up there and say that there is no constitutional or statutory requirement for them to spend money raised by this tax on this issue, and there is no statutory or, or constitutional prohibition for them to take that money out of the trust fund and spend it as they see fit. You can't credibly go to the legislators that are going to have to go back to their neighborhoods and say, look, we're going to raise the gasoline tax. Uh, and I think that's the that's where the, the biggest comment. Nobody wants to pay gasoline tax when they're going to pay four dollars or four and a half dollars per gallon of gas no matter how necessary it might be in the long run but i think like i said this is partially a self-inflicted wound based on you know the the actions of the executive and the the, the uh, legislative leadership over the last couple three years and then the county executive released his um county budget uh to the county council this past week and so in prince shortest county the issue of maintenance of effort and, and mandating funding is not really an issue because he funded the school system above maintenance of effort by about $30 million and cut every other department except for public safety departments by uh, 5% and is going to increase the number of people on the street and police and sheriffs and corrections and, mm -hmm. and, and fire. Uh, so, and, and still try to make investments um, with the capital budget as well. but. He, I mean, he had a tough year as well as with, the, with the, the deficit, and so the county council now will be pouring over this and has to come up with its answer. They have a little bit more time than the legislature they have until the end of, uh, end of May. But at least in this county, we're not arguing about uh, school funding and how much are you getting and how much do you have to get. And, and, and there won't be that kind of draconian things instituted here because, um, because it's being funded. But... My understanding is the budget that he came out with does not include any of this pass-through of the teacher pensions that may come back. Because the first year is actually supposed to be a net positive. They, they um, gave supplemental grants to make up for the first year. And so it's actually a, you actually well, the, net the, positive. As I understand it, and I think you've, you've, you've articulated it before, I think there's a phase in you yes. know, to the process. But even still, as I, I heard the executive over in Montgomery County was just screaming to high heavens about the effect on Montgomery County. Uh, and it's going to clearly affect Prince George's. Just, like I say, even though you might get by the first year, uh, I'm sure his people are doing the same thing that we're doing, and that is looking at year two, three, four, five, and six. Um, you know, most people I know that have been doing budgets for the last four or five years are anticipating not turning around much until 15 or 16. Um, yeah, the third and fourth and, year, it's going to be hit and hard. And then and that's when he's going to start getting hit with significant teacher pension obligations. Mm -hmm. Now, we also have gaming in play. And mm -hmm. I know Ooh, even if it's fun. approved, 
it's going to take a couple of years, even assuming it's approved, it's going to take a couple of years to get up and going and make some money. But that may bring in some money, especially to Prince George's County, if the executive gets his uh, world-class casino down at National Harbor. And he just might. Um, Caesars, that is going to own the uh, Baltimore City Casino, is now in favor of a Prince George's one. Mm -hmm. um, the Cordish company, which is going to run the mills, is still against it, but businessmen could always work out numbers if it's just hmm. numbers. I mean, they can yeah. work that out. So that might happen. Yeah, the challenge here is every projected expectation of income has been woefully overstated. Um, so I think prudence dictates that whatever they're anticipating collecting in this, you know, and, and I've heard numbers is $400, $600 million a year. Um, it'd be nice if they do that. Uh, you know, a, I'm, I'm not really sure that it's going to be a go. The, the indicators are that it will be, like you suggest, but uh, uh, I just can't see them pulling in that kind of money. Um, but you, know, you never know. I mean, the, the location at National Harbor would have the best chance of any of the casinos to pull in the money because it would suck in D.C. and Virginia much more mm -hmm. than any of the other Maryland locations would. Um, Except for maybe the convention center in Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think I think DC might even supersede Baltimore because yeah. of the airport, mm -hmm. the um, the convention tourist is, yeah. travel It'll in DC. It'll be a destination. Absolutely, mm -hmm. the conventions that already mm -hmm. come there. Not that Baltimore doesn't do plenty, also. Mm. But and international travelers, not just national travelers, but a lot of international, which I think would be more attracted, in my opinion, to the D.C. area than the Baltimore market. Mm -hmm. And contrast National Harbor to Rosecroft, where the people who would uh, go there would be locals. primarily locals, yeah. and we'd be taxing oh, ourselves. Oh, I think of the two sites, uh, if you're going to make a major investment and anticipate a return on your investment, the National Harbor clearly mm -hmm. would be the more attractive place to go, probably the more expensive place to go in terms of construction and all that, but uh, I mean, if I were a consumer and I had a choice between going to the old racetrack or going to there, it's not a tough choice. Now, the uh, bill had a hearing in the House Ways and Means Committee this past week, and uh, a lot of the Baltimore delegates are asking the county executive from Prince George's, um, where were you in 2007? How come Prince George's didn't ask for a casino then? And had a very Straightforward answer. He wasn't county executive then. Mm -hmm. That he tried and he didn't win. Mm -hmm. um, but there were some feelings that all these uh, other five casinos based their projections on five casinos and their business models are based on five casinos and having a six one upsets that. And his answer was yes, but we're, my proposal is to give more, give you more of the, the funds and have table games. The big the, you know, the thing table that games yeah. is different. The, I that's think that's but the thing changer. that really was shocking that came out this week was that the, the state's agreement to eat the cost of buying all the slot machines. You know, yeah. for, for the, I yeah. mean, and those are like 8,000 bucks a piece. So I didn't see the vote. What, was the vote two to one? I don't know. I don't know what the I numbers guess, were, but yeah, it I don't was know. a million. Yeah. I mean, it was a huge Twice number. The original and I'm price. surprised there yeah. wasn't an I told you so in the headlines. Mm -hmm. In other states, they don't buy the machines, the companies buy them exactly. for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. In Maryland, they that would be part them. of the basis for their percentage of the, of the gross. Uh, but for some reason, Maryland decided to make this magnanimous gesture to the, you know, the people that are going to run the casinos. So they're going to give them 40%, I guess, of the profits, and we're going to pay for all of the appliances uh, to, to work there. Maybe it has something to do with the safety and security of it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the reason was. But I was surprised that each each thing was valued at over eight thousand dollars. Yeah, I think people aren't as excited by these new slot machines. There's no arm crank, right? Yeah. yeah. And there's they don't there's no noise but, that comes uh, out of it, and the coins just, don't jingle out. You just get a little thing in your card. It's just a little piece of paper, and then you go. But well, there is some artificial noise, yeah. so you can hear <laughs> fake yeah. coins. And yeah. Yeah, it's and if you go yeah. if you go with uh, Lynn and her husband Joe, you know Joe always wins at these things. So and I uh, always lose. Yeah, that's that's, that's what we balance out. Oh. We've, we've we visited the one over at Ocean City one. They just for grins and Joe Skirpon was the only one that won any money. And you know and he wouldn't share and very little. <laughs> he bought that's, dinner. That's a good way to end <laughs> it up. Okay. He who wins buys dinner. Okay. Sounds fair. Thank you very much. See you next month. We'll see if we have a Republican nominee or not. <laughs> I say not. Take care. <laughs>